Welcome to Reconsider. I'm Bill Hartman. This is the podcast to challenge you to ask better questions, to look beyond traditional models of thinking and arrive at better health and fitness solutions. We get a lot of questions in recon about people take the people fill out the form that's like, what body shape are you? And then invariably, like a very high percentage of those people end up messaging us like, I don't know what body type I am, or how do I tell what body type I am? So I think kind of talking about self assessment of wide versus narrow, maybe touching on like, how it is a spectrum and continuum. Um, why that matters, why it might not even matter for depending on what style of training you're doing or what activities you're doing. And then maybe also talking about how there are like configurations that, that kind of just dis, like distinguish between different types of wides and narrows. Well, you're just talking about structural bias and, and how that creates the constraints within which that you have to move right so and that determines it determines like the stuff that you're good at the stuff that you're not so good at and it just it's just a matter of of trying to avoid um, conflict with the type of constraints that you would be more favorable um, in regards to performance yeah and i also want to try to get I want to try to help people overcome any type of like fear that they might have about, well, if I'm narrow and I'm doing things that are like supposed to be a part of a wide program, does that mean I'm going to get messed up? So like, like is that going to mess me up? Am I going to, am I going to injure myself because I'm doing, I'm a narrow and I'm doing bench press with a barbell? Cause Bill said that <laughs> you never, ever, ever, ever people will take anything that you say and, and, just kind of hyperbolize it, right? Extrapolate it to an absolute. Yeah, be like, narrows can never trap or deadlift, otherwise their spines will explode and they'll not be able to run fast or throw fast pitches anymore because they trap or deadlift it. It's like, no, that's not what we're saying. Well, it's not, and, it, and it never has been. It's, it's just about an yeah. understanding of what the potential consequences are. That's, that's the concern. Like there, there, there's going to be a point in time where if you follow a certain path, there will be adaptations that take place and some of them will be favorable in regards to certain aspects like force production and, and, and such, but there's consequences that would go along with it. So if I have somebody that has to be able to turn um, a great deal, like say a baseball pitcher who is a tall, slender individual, and they, so they behave a certain way, and if I take that ability to turn away from them by doing too much of something that may have been favorable initially and driving that adaptation harder, I will cross a certain point where I start to take something away that is valuable. So when we're talking about the normal folk, okay, general population, um, can they go down the wrong path and, and, and maybe not have as much success? Absolutely. Are they at risk? Well, the, the programming that we're, that we're offering um, is, is not the aggressive side of loading yet, because what we're doing is we're evolving people to develop certain types of qualities that will protect them from a long-term perspective. And so if you chose the wrong program, um, are, you, are you at risk? No, but it may not be as favorable as it would be if you selected something that would be a little bit more um, directed towards your, your physical constraints. Your physical yeah, it's more of like an, op it's like an optimization side of things. Right. It's like it's right. – because you're still effectively rolling around on the ground. You're acquiring yeah. – ranges of motion, you're creating shape change. It's just that maybe the angles on which you're doing things or the hand position is varied in a way that isn't ideal for your structure, but will still provide some sort of change. 
Correct. Correct. Yeah. It just might not be to the degree that you you have the potential for in regards to change. Right. Okay. So let's let's talk a bit about. So that it's not a very sensitive uh, or detailed way to do it, but we kind of just ask people to put themselves into these. It's like, what type of shape are you? Are you like a long, mm -hmm. narrow pole of an individual? Are you a wide barrel? Are you like a V-shaped right. funnel? Are you more of like a cone-shaped pylon style uh, of person? And within those, um, you could get kind of directed towards wide or narrow end of the spectrum. But I, I guess like, what are the other telltale signs of a wide versus a narrow that people would be able to see in themselves and almost like self-assess? Um, okay, so if, if, we use, if we use generalized terms as people have been described throughout history, right? Mm -hmm. um, short and stocky, right? Short and stocky. Yep. Okay. They will tend to be biased towards the, the, the wide helical archetype. Tall and slender will tend to be biased towards the, the narrow helical archetype. And those would be the extremes. And so everybody's going to kind of fall into between like the most narrow of narrow individuals, the most wide of wide individuals. Everybody's going to kind of fall in, into um, some degree in one way or the other. You're, you're definitely going to be biased towards one way or the other. Um, and you think about, okay, if I was an individual who played a sport in high school and I was reasonably successful, like not the best player, like I played basketball, but I was not a, you know, college level basketball player. I played in high school. Right. Um, but if you were a, a power based individual, that's how you would have been described. Right. Which implies some measure of strength, not the fastest guy, but, but if they needed like, you know, force, you're that guy, you're going to be biased more towards a wide helical archetype because they're a higher pressure structure, which, which lends itself towards force production, right? The taller slender people, um, will tend to be, um, you know, uh, on the on the other end, so they were better turners. It's like your a lot of your high school baseball pitchers that are that are more successful tend to be taller, slender individuals, right? Your center on the basketball team will tend to be biased more towards the narrow helical archetype, right? So so again, what sports you were successful in um, tends to sort of put you in a bucket if, it, if as it were, right? So we yeah. can use some of I mean, those elements to, to help you identify, you know, where you may fall in this spectrum of structure. So other, other things that come to mind when we're thinking in the context of like sports and athletics would be like, I always think about the presidential fitness test. Mm -hmm. And people, you know, some people might not even know what that is that I'm saying that. It's like <laughs> you're, sad. You're, are you dating yourself? Yes. Uh, maybe a little bit. I can, but, um, I can tell you, I can tell you how many bent knee sit-ups that I actually did on the, on the president's physical fitness test the first time I did it without having my feet held. So I, I could tell you that I did 46. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I used to, I used to, well, I, I, I realized early on, um, how much you could use the your hip flexors and your legs to do it. So I would just like crank, I could just crank them out. But I felt like, I, I mean, at the hindsight, I felt like I was cheating. But anyway, so the things that I think about, like your narrow individuals are probably going to be better at like the flexibility tests. And then they're going to be better at like the endurance running tests but your right. narrower, longer, slender individuals are usually going to fall short on like push-ups, Correct. Because yeah. of the pressure that they need to create, the angles that you have to use in order to do the push-ups, um, the length, the distance you have to travel because your arms are probably a bit longer. Yeah. Uh, so it's, 
that would be like, you know, if, if those are the things that you gravitated towards, like if you are always better at cross country running versus sprinting, like that can kind of start to categorize you in one direction or the other. Yeah. So yeah. those are like the, those are like the physical capability side of things. Like what are some of like the anthropometric visual sort of body shape things that people, I know we've mentioned in the past, like shapes and people's faces. We've talked a mm-hmm. bit about hands and feet, ankles and wrists. Um, kind of the size of joints, like the, mm-hmm. you know, like in yeah, bodybuilding, the, the, the they old, talk about the old, the old wrist thingy was, is, is usually a, you know, a, a pretty good one. Like if you've got a, you know, a, a, a thicker, heavier frame that would fall towards the, the wider category, you're going to have a, a, like, again, bigger circumferential measurements at certain places, knees, wrists, ankles. Yeah. So like the size of watch band that you wear can be telling Um, the fate. I don't want to skip over these things and assume that people have watched all of the 28 podcasts that we've had, but how could they, how could they have not Chris? Shame on you. So, so Bill, (laughs) Bill and I have, Bill has referred to like how you and I are a pretty good example of like, I'm much more narrow and you are much more wide of an individual. Yeah. Uh, and it, that can be, you can see that in like, I've shown this before, but there's like almost a, a, uh, yeah. So you have the angles that kind of come off of your nose. What's, what are these called? Yes. Like these folds, do they have a the, name? The, the labial folds. Yeah. I think they're facial labia actually. Aren't they? Okay. That's a little could be too sexual for this, for this podcast. It's but. not, but it's not, it's, 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 it's describing, I know, the, I know. It's describing the, the, the folds. So the, the folds here, and then the kind of like the folds that kind of come off the top of your brow, it sort of makes like a, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. it sort of makes a, like a hourglass sort of shape. Mm-hmm. And the, the wider that hourglass is, the wider your structure will tend to be. And then there's obviously like, when people think about wide and narrow archetypes, they always refer to things based on like, well, I'm a wide ISA, infrasternal angle, I'm a narrow ISA. That is something that can also be telling of your structure, but can also be confusing for some people because it, it how of how your ribs can bend. So I think we should talk about that because I think a lot of times mm-hmm. people will say like, I was measured as a wide and then I look at them and they're, they have really narrow face, they're tiny wrists, they're really tall. And I'm like yeah. this, before I even see their measures or watch them move, I'm like, that doesn't make yeah. much sense to me. Um, right. So how can, how can, a, how can a narrow present as a wide in the rib cage? How can a wide, I don't think a wide could ever present as a narrow. You would just have to be really bad at measuring, but how can a narrow, yeah. I think. It, it's usually, it's usually the confusion where, where someone is, is narrow and then they, they're biased towards a wide. Okay. So let's yeah. clarify some stuff. The, the unfortunate terminology is is the fact that the the we have to use the word angle. Yes, and and most people are used to thinking in two dimensions, which means that it looks like this, right? Yeah, and so they go like, "Oh, this is narrow, and then this is wide." Um, when it comes to uh, humans, we're cylindrical. And so we have to understand that that the it's not a flat plane angle that we're actually looking at. We're actually looking at at, at something that is helical. So it's actually following the shape of the cylinder. And so the way that the way that the ISA actually behaves is it turns. So as we breathe in, it turns up and down, and as we exhale, it turns down and in. And if we turn to the right, it goes like that. If we turn to the left, it goes like that. Okay. And so what we have to appreciate the fact is there there are there are strategies that many of us have where we use superficial musculature to control the position of our body in space. And so that squeezes the ribs. So the ribs are bendy. Sternum is bendy. Upper back is bendy. And so the harder we have muscles that like, think about your, your pecs, your, your chest muscles, your upper back muscles, they can squeeze you front to back. And then if you get squeezed front to back, if you started as a cylinder, you get squeezed front to back, then you get squeezed and you actually move sideways, right? You expand sideways. And so if I was a narrow helical archetype and I would typically have what would be considered this, this narrow helical, helical angle of the, of the ISA, but I squeeze you front to back, the ISA actually spreads sideways and it does become kind of a planar representation, right? It gets flatter, 
And so when you take a breath in, instead of having this nice turn that opens the, the ISA um, up and out, like we would see in a normal breath, what we get is a pure sideways kind of emotion. And then that creates confusion for people because they, they don't understand the helical structure because most people don't talk about that. And then they're looking at it again as a flat plane angle. And so you have people that are doing stuff like laying goniometers, right? To, to measure angles. They, they will actually lay goniometers on people's rib cages and go, oh, you're this, this big, so you must be wide, or you're this small, you must be narrow. And they're not accounting for the behavioral element of it, which is the, which is the turning. And so this is why the narrows will get confused with wides. So yeah, so trying to use a trying to use a two-dimensional a tool nine. to to see a four-dimensional representation is you're going to miss. Yeah. Yeah. But if you if you're 6 foot 9, um, you know, under 200 pounds and you and you think you're wide, you're probably not. And I'm using yeah. an extreme example to make a point. Right? But that that person could so that person could be squished so hard like this. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. that yeah. what what bill was trying to say like the 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 ribs are kind of straight straighter can creates yes. that narrow angle and the, but as you bend 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 with compression that gets the it now looks yeah. like a very wide representation so having that front to back space that a narrow would have will allow you to have the sort of narrow rib yeah. angle that squeeze from front to back will bend 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 the ribs because they are bendy like bill's saying and then you'll yeah. lay this person on the table compress them even more and be like oh this guy's super wide so then i get then i get a i get a referral from somebody that's a tennis athlete who's six foot four weighs 175 and they're like this guy's wide and i'm like uh I doubt that, but I'll take your word for it for to start, and we'll maybe we'll try some things. Um, but yeah, you're not, you know, when when you're dealing with and that. So link looping in the things we talked about already. We, I, we're talking about an overhead rotational athlete who's mm -hmm. say he's in college, he plays in college, so he's been good enough. He's been sort of naturally selected over time. The sort of long term athletic discovery that I, we haven't that I believe is something that you coined. A long time ago uh but we haven't talked about it yet maybe we'll do an episode on long-term athletic development how it's not real um <laughs> but for yeah man did we're you gonna just get open up a can of rufus is yeah. gonna be mad at you and uh the, that's the great i love any of, the whole country of Cana uh, canada and canada canada <laughs> america's hat um but yeah, yeah no like, it's yeah. uh yeah, I figure I figure in like four or five months time when someone makes their way through these podcasts, we'll get a couple of like passive aggressive comments. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, I can't wait for that. But oh, anyway, what was I saying? Uh, so about any, yeah, so like the tennis athlete, relating. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I got a college tennis player coming to me for a shoulder issue. The mm -hmm. PT that's sending them to me says he measures wide. And I'm thinking in my head, well, he's he's tall. He's six five. He's one seventy, so he's definitely tall and narrow. Um, yeah. He's played tennis at a high level, so I know he's good at rotating, and he can put his arm overhead over and over again, which would usually lend itself. If this is his first shoulder issue and he's twenty one, that would usually lend itself to him being sort of predisposed to being good at tennis. He has the tools. He has the genetic abilities to kind of mm -hmm. put himself in these positions. So that's yeah. sort of all of the things that we mentioned up to this point. That's like a practical example of like using the things that I know to determine if you, the person I'm working with is wide or narrow. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, you have, you have, uh, yeah. And you're not, you're not really going to see people who are wide that are met, that someone measures as narrow. I wouldn't think. It would it would be a very it would be very rare that that would that would be mistaken. Yeah. yeah, I would even know how they would have to be. There would have to be some. I would guess there would be some sort of bending happening, like at the like right around the xiphoid, that would make the angle look narrower. I don't know what type of bend that would be though. Um, if you had somebody that was 
oriented forward. So their, their body has shifted forward over their feet to the most significant of degrees to, to, to where they would be accused of being rounded shoulders, slouched postures. It's possible that the, that where the apex of the, of the angle um, is located. So right as it meets the sternum, it's possible that you could get some shape change that would be implied as a narrow. Sometimes when, when people look at these things and they look too close to the sternum, that yeah. you know, get some confusion there. But like I said, it's very, it'd be very rare. Be, yeah. So like a, basically most like people a are really... compressed anterior posterior, right? It, it, like right. You're not going to get squeezed side. You, there's, there's no great way for muscles to squeeze you side to side. Well, you so could like you could have a strong place. enough you could have a strong enough rectus abdominis strategy to pull down really super hard at the the ribs proximal to the sternum. Yeah, yeah. And that could maybe make it look like, and that's you know that's another fault of measurement as well because people just kind of like jam their index fingers into the xiphoid right below the sternum, and then they're like, oh, it's here or it's here, and they don't kind of see the influence of everything bending outward. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, we talked a bit about. So maybe let's talk about um, the configurations within the wide mm -hmm. to narrow, and then how mm -hmm. that you know it changes the top the the pressure gradients from top high pressure, bottom low pressure, mm -hmm. and how that affects what yeah. abilities the wides or narrows have. Yeah. Um, so if you looked at superheroes, okay, um, anybody that knows the Frank Miller version of the Dark Knight Returns, okay, he made Batman a wide ISA um, pillar. Yeah, the right? widest you can it's get. Like the chest... The chest, the waist, and the the hips are all the same circumference, right? So you, you so you, you imagine this this pillar construction of an individual, okay? That that is a configuration of someone that produces a lot of pressure. So if we were to extrapolate this into the real world, these are going to be your really super heavyweight powerlifters. So they're going to create a structure that that doesn't have like the bodybuilder style V taper of an, of a, of a physique. They're going to have a, a wide structure and you can stack a lot of weight on this. These are the high pressure individuals, right? They tend to be very, very strong, not necessarily very fast. Um, the other way to look at this since it's, it's uh, playoffs and Super Bowl coming up is if you look at the NFL, you want to look at an offensive lineman. They're going to, they're going to be more of your pillar construction. Very, very forceful, um, but not, like I said, the fastest guy in the room. Okay. Um, the other representation where you would have, say, uh, a chest, a rib cage, and hips that are about the same circumference, but a much longer structure would be um, what we would refer to as a piston. And so the great representation of that would be um, somebody that's a like a marathon runner. So there's there's a very small differential, if any, between like the the chest circumference and the pelvic circumference. And in what that lends itself to, it's a lower pressure structure, but it it is a very efficient structure. So you can do things for longer periods of time with less fatigue. But you're not going to be the strongest guy in the room. And so those are those are pretty easily distinguishable. Um, as far as, you know, like you were talking about, it's like, hey, if you're the cross country runner, chances are you're going to kind of fall towards that piston -y kind of a guy versus the pillar kind of a guy. Um, you're not going to be the strongest guy in the weight room, but you're going to be a, a pretty decent distance runner. Okay. Maybe yeah. not the fastest guy, but you can keep it up for a really long time. Right. Okay? okay. And then the, the other okay. aspects. Okay. Go yeah. Ahead. So oh, the, yeah, v, the V, the V and the, I guess what the things that, cause we've talked about wides and narrows on several different occasions. Uh, so the, the wide shoulders, wide hips, narrow shoulders, narrow hips, but mm -hmm. now thinking about like 
how you had you can have high and low pressure upper and lower sort of making more of like a funnel or a cone shape uh-huh. and and I, I what i want to also get into is like how that varies like having do the funnels and the cones exist in wides and narrows do some of them yes. typically exist more so in narrows versus wides let's get into that a little bit so the, the 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 advantage of a funnel, so wider at the top, narrower at the bottom, is is you would you would see this in sort of what would be described as explosive capability of movement. So somebody that can move quickly, because it's easier to unweight yourself. So you can jump a little bit higher. You're you got that quick first step kind of a guy. Um, you're you're pretty good with with the uh, with acceleration. Right. So, you know, if you were a good leaper, fast runner, um, more described as an explosive athlete, really good change of direction, you're, ten- you're going to tend towards the, the funnel because it, it, you can apply forces into the ground and you can move quickly because you can unweight. The unfortunate opposing representation is the exact opposite, because this this would be the person that. um doesn't move real quickly, but is also hard to move. So there's there's advantages there too. Um, so you, you you have consequences that would be associated with more pressure coming down from the top that would push you into the ground. And as I'm fond of making making fun of him, um, although he's the world's greatest accountant, my accountant would be a representation of that. He is narrow at the top than he is at the bottom. Right. And it doesn't mean that he can't play sports. It doesn't mean he can't be a good athlete. It just means that he has a different mechanical challenge where it's much more difficult for him to leave the ground than say the funnel shape guy. But you okay. can have and you then, can extrapolate that you could extrapolate that across where Yeah, uh, but I mean uh, the I guess what I'm wondering is in your clinical experience, have you seen a lot of like wide pylons? narrow pylons and, and like yes. wide V shapes versus narrow V shapes. And like what, yes. how would narrow like, so pylons, that, that's narrow the worst possible scenario for pressure. Is, is it um, by a long shot, by a long shot. Yeah, yeah, it, is, yeah. it is one of the most difficult things to manage because they're a low pressure person, which means that they don't push against the ground very hard. And then they have a bias of downward pressure internally that just sticks them to the ground. Um, I will give you an, an example. So I, I, I had a recurring patient who had um, three foot fractures, not at the same time, seasonally had three foot fractures where she was just not well designed for a high force producing type of an activity and she liked to go hiking. And, and so she, she broke her foot three times on three different occasions um, because of the amount of force that was actually going through her foot. Um, and again, it, she just, she picked something that probably wasn't structurally ideal for her, or she wasn't, you know, properly prepared for such a thing to the degree that she could have been. Right. So let's, let's talk a bit about like why conceptually that would happen. So her guts are going down, gravity is dragging everything down. She can't really create the forces with her muscles to overcome it. So it kind of gets narrows, dragged. Narrow's tendency, narrow's tendency to be low pressure, which means that they're not the most forceful person. Right. So, so then then the bones are trying joint like ligaments and bones are trying to create the the pressure because that's like the next hardest thing. That's like the next thing to try to take over. And then it just hits a point where it, the bone can't overcome because it's not really designed to. And it just. Works. Right. Cause the, the bones are, the bones are connected tissue just like everything else is. So they hit, they bend and they twist and they expand and they compress and they, they become stiffer. And so if I need more stiffness in a certain circumstance, I can't produce it the way, the way. So think about this, 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 strongest stiffness that this person could produce would be to squeeze themselves at the top of their structure harder than at the bottom, which would push down harder. And so literally it creates more and more and more pressure downward, which would increase the stiffness, right? At the lowest point possible, which is your foot, right? And so you turn the foot into one thing, Right. And so instead of having all 29 joint movable joints in your foot and all these bones and all this cool connective tissue, 
push as much pressure down into the foot as you can so it becomes one piece, and then ask it to bend forcefully in an undesirable circumstance. And so then something has to give way. And that's basically what happens. Because yeah. it, and 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 again, the, then the fracture is in the same place every time. Um, unfortunate. Right. And, and again, so that's just, that's a weird circumstance to make a point. Right. I'm not saying right. That that right. But it's idea, it, but. it makes a lot of sense because you're the the low low pressure bottom, high pressure top. The high pressure top is sort of set up to squeeze more. So in a in a in a scenario in which I'm asking my body to create force and squeeze, yes. the bias is going to be to squeeze harder up top, which is going to shove stuff down even more. Right. Like a toothpaste right. tube, stuff's going yeah. down into the tube. Right. It hits the foot. The muscles aren't 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 there isn't a good pressure environment to create that sort of overcoming action of the muscles of the foot. Everything is stuck, sort of rotated out completely onto one side of the the bias of ER to IR. And then I just mm -hmm. try to put force into that ER stiff yeah. foot and it just right. breaks. Right. Now, if we understand this process. Then this lends itself to being able to design a program that would consider these these what would be perceived as disadvantages and then say, like, OK, how can we overcome these disadvantages and produce a more favorable situation, a better shape at the foot, a better position at the knee, a stronger uh, pressurized position at the pelvis that would allow them to push down in the ground, which actually lifts you back up to overcome these 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 structurally down forces. So like, if, you know, we, we'll get, we'll get kids, you know, in the gym that, that would have this physical structure and they tend to be, sometimes they're, they're really big kids. And so, you know, they're, you know, six foot three, six foot four, six foot five, but they have this physical structure. And so their height lends themselves to playing certain sports. So like they're playing basketball or something like that. And, and then understanding is like, okay, they're not the fastest kid, but if you train them effectively and we can teach them to unweight this, this structural influence where they can take a few steps very, very quickly, reposition themselves, and then they become the immovable object. So, so they're the kid that, that plays off the block and, and on the basketball team. And he'll get a lot of rebounds because he understands how to position himself really, really well. And then nobody can move him. And so that's a tremendous advantage on, you know, on, on if they're, if they're playing football, um, a defensive tackle in, in with this, this physical structure takes up some really good space and then becomes very, very difficult to move. Right. Um, so, so th we can use this by, by position, um, and then train them effectively so they can overcome some of these, these mechanical disadvantages to where they actually perform exceptionally well. But we have to understand that first. And so that's why the that's why, you know, understanding a little bit more about structure helps us design a better program for that individual. Right. And then um we've talked a little bit before about how wide, um, how like a V shape and a wide structure, just a general wide IS versus a V shape can kind of utilize the same strategies early on because of the top down or sorry because of the the pressure orientation of the v versus you're, you're talking about a, a a wide funnel no i thought, thought you okay yeah so what's the question um why that like why why someone who that is v-shaped who is has a very big like v shape or a, a very big like v-shaped bias you can treat them like a wide even if they are maybe more narrow i don't know i don't know the best way to if put you the look question. at okay if you, if you look at the common out look at the commonalities so if i can unweight if i can unweight the pelvis right i can push up more yeah right it's easier for me to push up as a as a wide helical archetype, I have a bias that gives me that same capacity to push up. It's a, it's a again, it's a higher pressure physical structure. So there would be a similarity in in some of their capabilities to overcome the the downforce of gravity or even a downforce of of just self imposed structural 
um, pressure. Right? Right. So if I, if I squeeze myself top down, I still have pressure that I can push up. Whereas if I had, you know, the, the, the pylon based structure, which makes it more difficult to do so, that would be similar in, in, in response to somebody that doesn't have the same pressure capabilities at the bottom of the pelvis to push up. Yeah. So those, those could initially in your programming could lend itself to having wide, the V shapes be categorizes in the wider category because they can push up better versus mm -hmm. the pylons and the narrows being together because they don't have the same capabilities of pushing pressure up from the bottom. Okay. That, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I think that we kind of covered all of our bases for like just the wide versus narrow. Um, I mean, I think we talked a lot about pressure strategies and pressure gradients in a way that we ha haven't before. So hopefully people find that useful. Yeah, well, it should be useful. Right. And if you've gotten yeah, to this point, if you've gotten to this point in the podcast, congratulations. Uh, you if go. you haven't looked yeah. into the program that Bill created for this stuff, Recon, I think you should, because yeah. we're talking about all of this yeah. stuff that we've talked about in this podcast has been funneled into that. It's the program before the program. Yeah. Well, it's the program before the program, but it becomes the program after doing the program before the program. So now you're you progress into the program that's that's uh, preempted by the program before the program. <laughs> <laughs> no one's watching this anymore, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> that'll be our that'll be our new ad reel for. It's just me saying <laughs> program a... over and over again. <laughs> this is my my panicked my panicked elevator pitch. Do you imagine like I'm on Shark Tank trying to explain that? And that was what oh I my said. Gosh. Shark Tank. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a Shark Tank recon. That'd be awesome. <laughs> it's the program before the program. And I just stopped talking and then he's like, Well, actually <laughs> Well you see, yeah. There's a program after the program before the program. It becomes the program. Right, and then it becomes the program to end all programs because you don't need another program after doing the program before the program to get to the program. Well, you know, <laughs> the 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 reality is 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 that the the people that this is for are the ones that that have tried to, you know, move in into some sort of structured programming without the necessary physical preparation. Some people, some people don't need as much preparation to do certain types of training, and then some people need a lot more. And so, yeah, and if, what, if you're dealing with if you're dealing with a pressure strategy that's less than ideal, you really need to take this stuff into consideration. And no one really is. So the, the programs you're choosing are not, even if they even if they say that they're like valuing whatever model they want to say is Bill's model, the expansion compression model or whatever they want oh, to call it. Oh, man, I'm just going to throw up now. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're basing, they're basing a lot of it off of measures that might be incorrect because they're taken in a 2d. They're taken from a 2d perspective, which we kind of talked about earlier. They are talking about things and not really respecting the pressure movement that we're talking about from high to low, low to high. Um, and it's just like, you know, except, except no substitutes when it comes to this stuff. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> is that, is that our.